Thank you very much. Um, I, I first like to say that this is really fantastic. The whole conference, the conference that happened before, true multidisciplinarity, as it is sometimes called behind closed door as a kind of a derogatory term, is something that is exceedingly rare. And uh, so this group of people uh, sort of nurturing that, uh, I think, is, is a really, really fantastic kind of thing. And uh, anybody who has followed the talks in the last couple of days knows that the full bandwidth uh, of things is stuff you typically don't see together and the togetherness is really not only possible but also necessary to actually make progress and uh, so I try to um, sort of um, stand in that tradition and follow up on uh, what has been said and now I have to get the Zoom window out of the way here so I actually can see my own slides. Um, so can you see the slides? Yes, very good. So basically, um, I, I try to follow up uh, um, to what happened uh, throughout the week. And you will see that obviously there's lots of material which is uh, at the same time different, but also ties in with many aspects. And so I added a bunch of material which sort of, um, I think, will provide interesting sort of like um, points of discussion. But in general, this talk is split into multiple parts, which uh, are um, trying to characterize different types of spaces. And in particular, there is a twofold thing going on. One is obviously the space that, you know, three-dimensional space that surrounds us. And the other thing is conceptual meaning spaces, which can be both topological like networks and at the same time, uh, can also be multi-dimensional vector spaces and stuff like that. Um, and so I will give you examples. This is not in any case sort of uh, the final answer or the most general thing, but I think it needs to be exemplified that these kind of things uh, do exist in cultural uh, science slash um, uh, culture as a subject of research and as such uh, warrant to be studied. So cultural meaning spaces and cultural data analytics. Um, I will start with similarity space, um, AKA uh, polymorphic visual family resemblance. Uh, the last two words are Wittgensteinian. Visual was something brought in by Eleanor Roche and polymorphic means there is no such thing as simple description of an image. Typically, there's many, many different ways that come together. And so this thing is sort of an old um, uh, thing. Um, in archaeology, for example, people do pictures like the one in the center below, which is a similarity field of, you know, pots and vases, both uh, existing and, um, um, and, you know, out of fantasy. Um, and so this picture was actually printed by Rupert Riedel, uh, who's an evolutionary biologist in a book called Structures of Complexity. And one of the interesting things he says is there is no such thing as discrete engrams um, in culture and art. And so basically you have this kind of landscape of things that are more or less discrete, but often less discrete. Nevertheless, uh, you find things uh, like this. Oops, sorry. Um, you find things like this. Uh, where it's very clear that there's a sort of common type going on. So this is what A.B. Warburg in the 1920s called uh, a pathos formula. So basically some configuration of human body pose that has some meaning and uh, transports a lot of loaded, in this case, theologic, either positive or negative uh, theology. Um, Obviously, this thing uh, is so interesting that people have started uh, trying to make sense of it systematically. To the left, you see a plate of one of the 72 plates of A.B. Warburg's Memnusuna Atlas, where he tried to sort of like put together all these um, figures um, that are basically looking similar, having um, different and um, different meanings and different forms, same form, different meanings, same meaning, different forms, um, trying to figure out how this polymorphic family resemblance things work. Um, he literally went, quote unquote, nuts over it. So he uh, lost his distance in his own word uh, and went to the sanatorium until uh, Ernst Cassira sort of like, you know, sort of like let him know that he was actually writing up to something. And then they started this project, among others, uh, to make sense of this kind of, um, you know, sort of like what we now call polymorphic family resemblance. To the right, you see a random, not so random uh, Pinterest board, which obviously is now one way where 
crowdsourcing and algorithmic and similarity matching sort of like leads to this Pinterest boards where you can also see these kind of uh, resemblances. In the upper left corner, you see the Nika of Samatraka and BNC wearing a dress that sort of like puts her in the same realm. And so basically that kind of thing is something we have going on all over the place. Now, this is a hard problem. Here is five pictures of the same ruin. And uh, I would assume if you're not trained in seeing this particular ruin from different sides, it's probably pretty hard to make sense that it is the same ruin. Um, um, an easier example is the rheology of cats, um, you know, polymorphic catology, so to speak, um, conformal catology <laughs> uh, to be in the spirit of yesterday. Um, this is something which is obviously very, very hard if you do it in a sort of like, you know, sort of like, very stereotypical uh, way, but at the same time, we all know as humans, it's really easy to start to recognize cats. Like even the cat in a bowl is really easy to recognize for humans. So how does this work? So nowadays we have actually made lots of progress, particularly in the last 10 years, with this thing called convolutional neural networks, a method from the eighties, merging with lots and lots and lots of data, lots and lots and lots of energy, having lots of layers in a neural network. So this is sort of the connectionist um, implementation. Um, you feed an image to that neural network, which is trained with many, many images. And as an output, you get some kind of vector or you, know, you could map some label to that, but typically it's a vector. And obviously if you wanna have the distance between two images, you get the distance between the two vectors. Uh, you could take this um, set of vectors and actually sort of like, you know, do some dimensionality reduction and then you get a picture like this. Um, whoops. Uh, you get a picture like this. This is a T-SNE plot of uh, all of the images in WikiArt. Um, so 150,000 images. And the neat thing about this, if you zoom in, is that this is again a similarity field like Rupert Riedel's. And so this is contiguous areas in this T-SNE plot and you can see they make a lot of sense. So there is really similar images are clustering together. Actually, let me go back to this picture here. We decided it would make sense because polymorphic family resemblance, right? Polymorphic, uh, to actually put some sunglasses in front of the neural network. Alternatively, you could actually weight the network internally, but let's be really blunt and put sunglasses in front of it. Let's only give the neural network, the same neural network with the same standard training uh, contoured images, uh, so the contours of the image are only the color information, like basically colors sorted as a strip, which you can see um, here um, in three versions. And in the lower right corner, you can see how this would look, what you give the image basically at uh, the, the neural network. And then you can actually go on and um, sort of like filter the whole thing. So here you see, again, a T-SNE plot of a smaller collection of um, uh, that is sort of the result of giving the neural network just the contour. And as you can see, this guy with the uh, blue jacket um, is actually sort of like clustered with the portraits, which makes sense. Uh, but I could do the same thing and basically tell the neural network just the color information. And then this happens, uh, the blue guy is clustered with images that you really would like to have together in a living room. Um, if you're an interior designer, this is probably uh, something that either makes you very afraid or uh, you may think, oh, that's a really good tool to sell to people sort of similar images, which otherwise have nothing to do with each other, but really fit well together in terms of chromaticity. So in, in, in very short, we could say uh, we have now cracked connoisseurship. So there is now machines who are just as good in clustering similar images together, by the extension, you could say spotting what is a Caravaggio, uh, then human connoisseurs or you know, human radiologists. Um, we all hear these news, you know, there's a neural network that is better in recognizing breast cancer or you know, skin cancer than uh, sort of a human practitioner. This is exactly what's going on here. But one key issue that we haven't solved yet is we typically don't know what's going on between stimulus and response. These ne neural networks are super, super complicated and obviously are now a subject of study themselves. So we have to engage in some kind of, uh, you could say, artificial neural science. And so this is what sort of led us to an idea that we really would like to actually come up with a kind of explainable similarity space, because this would allow us to actually sort of make sense of um, both what humans think and 
um, sort of what um, neural networks do, for example, right? So can we fix, in other words, the dimensions and actually make this space sort of a measurable space, even though it may be multidimensional? And so there is a paper that dropped, uh, the preprint dropped on, um, so as we submitted it last Friday, uh, we sent out the tweet, uh, I think, 10 minutes before the start of this conference. Um, and this is a lucky coincidence, um, I have to say, but um, it is um, a very, very fitting coincidence. So this is now an archive. Um, Andres Karius is a senior fellow in, in the Kudan group who did most of the heavy lifting uh, for the implementation of the research and also did a lot of progress there. Uh, Mark Anitzula and Tilman Ulm are both artists in our group, but also researchers uh, who helped. And the two PI authors are Sebastian Honored and myself. And so my sort of like background is more this polymorphic family resemblance, and you will see later image classification art history and stuff like that. While Sebastian Honored is a, um, uh, is a complexity, uh, complex system scientist, network scientist, uh, with also a very, very multidisciplinary background. And he had a really unbelievably cool idea. So there is, for a long while, um, the notion that paintings or artworks in general are sort of the algorithmic products uh, from, say, the palette with unmixed colors to the canvas. Okay, so Max Benson sort of like um, um, uh, came up with this idea together with the ideas of quantitative uh, aesthetics of Birkhoff, uh, Rigaud, and so on, you can actually bring this together and uh, basically have this idea of saying, okay, <clears throat> if the painting is the product of some algorithm, which may be very general, may be very complicated, but nevertheless, of an algorithm, you could imagine that uh, the artworks of an artist sort of follow more closely a similar algorithm than uh, of two different artists. And now one of the interesting things is that if you uh, think about it in this way, you can assume that uh, the, uh, the image or the algorithm is stable under transformation. So if we transform the image in many, many different ways, um, images that have the same algorithm would stay closer together in space than um, in other way. And how do you measure this transformation? Basically, what we um, the simplest way is to do um, uh, compression length, so Kolmogorov complexity, which for which obviously some kind of um, upper bound we can we can basically just compress the file. So what you see here is a painting by Piet Mondrian, Windmill in the Gain. And um, you can see this is a meter by meter 26. Um, there's lots of stuff happening on this painting. You will probably have a very hard time describing everything that is going on, um, you know, other than it's a windmill in a landscape with a horizon and stuff like that. So the, the, looking at this painting, the sort of like uh, symbolic description of it or, you know, feature recognition object like uh, description of it is sort of simple, but there is lots of stuff going on. And so here's how we capture this. We transform the images, in our case, in 112 ways. This is only half of them. And uh, then compress them. And so above every little image here, every, the one in the upper left is, a is, is the raw image. Uh, and then everything else is a transformation from uh, you know, basically blurring to Fourier transform. Um, you basically um, transform, and then you compress. And in the upper right corner, you can see this number C, which is the compression ratio of sort of the, comp uh, the, the transformed and compressed version divided by uh, sort of the original file size. And so as you do this, obviously, what you get is um, a vector. Uh, here is this vertical thing where the arrow points uh, of this part, like every column in this matrix is a painting by Mondrian in this case. Um, and obviously you get some over and under expression uh, of like how large and how small this uh, whole thing is. So some value of the sort of like compression ratio. And you can do this for every painting. So here the X axis in this matrix is time. The Y axis is actually the, um, um, the uh, compression, uh, transformations and compressions. And you can see to the right, we've clustered this. So you can see there is some transformations that do line and shape clarity, others do color complexity, and others do sort of like detail compressibility, like basically how many objects are in there and stuff like that. And if you look at that matrix and you go from left to right, you can clearly see uh, there is something happening 
uh, about two thirds into this, so the, the 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 shape of this matrix fundamentally changes. So if this was a biology paper, we'd make it to PNAS, right? And so basically, there is some really interesting stuff going on here. Now, obviously, we cannot only do this for one painter, but we can do it for everybody. Um, and we can do it for very large uh, sets of images. And we can do the very same thing that we have done with the machine learning, use uh, dimensionality reduction, such as TSNE or PCA or um, UMAP, and draw a similarity field. And so here's just to show that this works. So here's a UMAP, uh, which is basically some sort of, um, you know, it's related to sort of like spring embedded network layout uh, over the distances. Um, so you can see that this makes some sort of sense. So here, every pixel is a painting and every painting uh, is reduced to sort of its dominant color. And uh, the callouts tell you that, uh, you know, the images in the vicinity of the callout point uh, are truly similar. So they're, they're, it, it really works. So now I want to emphasize that this is not machine learning. This is, this is simple transformation. And for like, we literally went down the list of image magic transformations. Um, of course, we picked uh, the ones that, you know, there are similar ones and whatever. So there's some, you, 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 at some point you decide what you do and what you don't do. But, you know, in general, you can do arbitrary transformations and then you do this kind of compression and then you do this kind of embedding. So we arrive at the same goal without any network training, without any sort of super complicated uh, 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 training and computation. And in particular, we don't need to do something like a comparison of images such as uh, you know, uh, normalized compression distance where you have pairwise comparison of every image over every other image. But every image is just embedded once. Okay, so you get this UMAP, which is a similarity field. And now um, here is uh, sort of the, 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 the super magic that can happen. Um, now we're at the same point as we are with the machine learning, but there is one difference. Um, we can use the similarity field as a kind of reference topography. So it's a little bit like, okay, so there's no geography of artworks, um, but we want to use our grid cells, so to speak. So we actually just put the UMAP there. And then we're going to map all the other uh, um, transformation dimensions uh, to versions of this UMAP. And so basically we make a heat map out of it, um, which, you know, obviously we could do it in different ways. But here, every single one of these pictures you see, of these uh, plots you see, is a heat map version of the UMAP you see in the uh, upper left corner. So basically, every painting would appear in the same coordinate it appears in the UMAP. But then we take the average in every sort of cell or region of the heat map um, of the particular transformation measure. So raw compression, blur, and so on. And if you stare at this picture, what you can see is indeed it makes sense to do it in this multidimensional way because they all look different. So this is a really interesting notion, right? So while at the same time the UMAP makes sense as a similarity field, you can see there's huge variation over this compression parameters. And basically every additional compression parameter allows you to sort of lock in uh, sort of artworks in some sort of algorithmic way. And um, I'd like to emphasize that this here is sort of a really simplified version of the whole thing, because there is these uh, plots that appear mostly gray. Now imagine at any given cell of this plot, um, um, the images that are in that particular cell could all be close to the average, or they could just cancel each other out, but actually uh, sort of um, span the entire parameter space. And that is a really interesting thing because this is subject to future study because you can imagine, like for example, you're an artist and you want to get close to sort of depicting the human body in a naturalistic way, like, you know, like sculptors in ancient Greece or painters working up to Raphael. Now, one of the key things, once you reach that point, the question is like, how stable is that point? Would you go further? Um, you know, are you driven further, or are you? Do you have drive to go further and stuff like that? And here we can actually take a look if the artworks that coincide in a particular locations actually what are what is the sort of like bandwidth of where you're going. So basically, we can now study this space because we have this sort of like um, multi-dimensional space with actual explainable dimensions. Because for every single one of these dimensions, we know exactly what it is doing. Okay. So now the question is, is this sort of viable? 
Okay, so obviously the first thing we did is this is uh, if this is uh, cognitively plausible. Um, and here there is data sets like multi-pic, uh, you know, triangle, very simple, vulture picture seeming to be the most complex picture. So people in uh, six languages were asked uh, if, um, if these images are simple or complex. And based on that sort of norm, uh, we could test our algorithm and uh, basically uh, figure out that we're actually doing better than the variance between the languages. So, so this thing really seems to work and it's cognitively plausible. Similarly for fractals, so there is the set of fractals which sort of uh, German speakers were exposed to and they had to sort of like, um, um, you know, um, point out if they're more simple as the one, the spiral to the left or more complex as the one on the right. And so this seems to work too. Second evaluation we took was to actually ask, okay, can we um, sort of um, predict metadata categories with this sort of non-metadata thing? So we have we were talking about quantitative aesthetics here, right? So it's the content of the actual, the pixel content of the of the images, and so um, obviously it should make sense in terms of. Uh, you know, predicting authors, um, dates, style periods, medium genre, and so on. So, as a as a, this actually also works. Uh, but just to give you an, uh, a sort of idea how hard this could be, um, on the top you see five example styles in our historical data set. We have two data sets. Uh, so far, you have only seen the historical data sets at seventy five thousand paintings uh, spanning a long period of time. And so here you see uh, the five centroid images of five art styles. Um, and um, I showed them, we showed them to you because, um, you know, if you think about uh, prototypical examples of styles, typically the ones uh, that are really, really um, very, very different uh, are, are shown. But here you can see that sort of like in the large bulk mass, uh, yes, they look different, but there is actually some confusion going on, which is quite interesting. And at the bottom, the same thing is true for artists. You know, the, the first line or second line from top in general, um, George O'Keefe, obviously super recognizable, right? So you can even, one of the things when we did this thing with the color strips, even there, you know, you could uh, print a little uh, color strip and you would totally know it's George O'Keefe just by the gradient of colors. While the two uh, guys at the bottom, Lawrence and Romney, um, are a little bit more hard, right? It's, yeah, if you know them well, uh, you, you could probably separate them, but at particular, this low, low resolution, they're not that far apart uh, to, for, for an untrained eye to sort of like disambiguate uh, very clearly. So the, there, there's, there's some confusion. So we can never be perfect in this kind of thing, right? And so nevertheless, actually it works. So we use some very, very simple machine learning um, um, methods, a linear discriminant analysis, and train a classifier uh, with 10, 100, 1,000 um, of these examples. And then basically what you can see on the x-axis is taking into account more and more dimensions. And as you can see, the more dimensions of your transformations you take into account, the more your predictability actually goes up. Um, and that's not the only take home from this thing. The other take home is interesting, which is the list of top five transformations is different for different tasks. So to recognize artists and centuries, for example, uh, color luminance and embossing, for example, play a, a, a more prominent role than, for example, uh, for a landscape, a portrait for landscape, obviously line. Um, so the contour basically separates the two. Uh, while drawing or oil painting, obviously it's the color um, that, that separates them. And one interesting thing is style periods versus centuries is sort of different, which is pretty interesting because they are functionally different also. Like, you know, centuries sort of like you have exponential growth over time, uh, while style periods typically are bucketized. So actually they fit in equally sized uh, museum departments. So you have 500 pictures in each building basically. At the bottom, you see the confusion between the art styles. And so unsurprisingly, Rococo and Baroque are uh, quite confused, while other things such as Art Nouveau uh, are sort of more singular. Um, and again, here, not only the classification makes sense, but also the confusion. And I say this for the stray computer scientists in the room, because uh, confusion is something which is not just something you should get rid of because of type one and type two errors, but um, in such systems, confusion is basically one of the most interesting things to know, which we want to basically analyze. So now this is sort of like now how it works. And 
uh, what the, um, um, the evaluation of it is. But now what we're gonna do with it, right? And so here we've done the following. Uh, so here you see the aesthetic dynamics of several hundred years of uh, painting uh, across a data set of 75,000 artworks, uh, which is the left two large plots. And uh, the first 175 days of the Hicket Nunc contemporary NFT art market, which started in March, 2021. And in the first 175 days, there were 85,000 artworks that were published and sold or not. So that is what you see on the right. You can uh, see a number of interesting differences, like unrelated to our methods, the same thing, every dot is a sort of like dominant color reduction of a painting to one pixel. Um, obviously at the NFT, we only looked at static images. Uh, so now the interesting thing is there is a color difference. You can see on the right, uh, it's RGB color, which uh, feeds into the NFT data on the left. In the historical data, obviously you're bounded by the pigments that are available. So preceding 1800, this is a little bit more brownish or dark than you can see. Um, and then from 1800 onwards, you have other pigments coming in, but there is a very clear different color space going on than RGB. Um, both in terms of like um, what is possible, what's not possible mutually. Uh, now, in our method, so the top two plots, uh, actually um, what we did here is not like all the compressions, but we basically bundled them with principal component analysis. So there is a bunch of uh, correlating uh, transformations, which um, principal component one, which basically sum up the texture and detail complexity. And the bottom two large plots sum up to overall compressibility. So this is just a regular compression, basically, um, off the top. This is principal component number two. And what you can see on the left side in the historical data set is a very distinct broadening of the parameter space, particularly from 1800 onwards. And uh, so you can actually see there's a clear difference between sort of, you know, sort of more... Um, detailed realism impressionism and sort of abstract art there's a lot of like there's much more compressible stuff going on while um in the bottom plot you can actually see there's huge difference between things around 1800 uh you know or like preceding 1800 where you get these rococo portraits which are very smooth not much detail like long gradients and stuff like that while um in the 20th century everything is possible cubism expressionism surrealism and so on so parameter space everything is all over the place now if we move to the nft stuff on the right note that the y-axis are different but actually if you would rescale the y-axis uh, on the left uh, to match the nft data you could actually see that you can read these plots from left to right because the onset of the nft data is actually very much um, in line with the historical artworks. And uh, you can see these vertical stripes, much like in the uh, historical data, this is basically data we lack. Like there's WikiArt, uh, which is sort of like the you know, original source of this data, um, is sort of known to be underexpressed in the 18th century and the NFT uh, marketplace sort of had technical difficulties and all sorts of like scraping stuff. So you get these vertical lines basically. And so basically, um, one of the interesting things is you have the same parameter space, but then something really, really interesting happens. About at day 100, there is this, um, in, the, in the upper right plot, you see this like colorful things, like primary color things coming in. This is like not complex digital art as that would be in line with the mainstream of regular art, but this is actually... Uh, sort of CryptoPunk like avatar series, you know, this uh, Pokemon demo dudes, NFT people, sort of the Hicket Nunk equivalent of the sort of board ape kind of things that every one of us has seen by now, unfortunately. So one of the interesting things there is that they're completely out of the stream of sort of like regular stuff. And uh, one of the interesting things is that in the second um, principal component, they're actually sort of mainstream, but also more narrow. Uh, if you can see, there is a sort of narrowing going on. So the, the NFT market really looks different in the first 100 days than it looks in, looks in the follow-up. And one of the interesting things you can ask, obviously, because NFT data has this neat uh, uh, coincidence that you get all the data that art historians are hunting for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, uh, which is you get the artwork itself, the uh, metadata of the artwork, the creator, the creation date, the minting date, 
uh, the uh, sales, uh, you know who uh, sells it, you know who talks about it, and you know, uh, you know what the price was. So it, it's really sort of like a, um, you know, it, it's like it's like Twitter, the Twitter of um, uh, of the art world. Basically, um, if you say Twitter is sort of like like Twitter behaves to regular computational linguistics, right? There's plenty of works on Twitter, and probably will have similar amount of works coming up on the NFT markets due to that sort of like perfection of like how much information you get. So if you look at these insets here at the bottom right corner, these are basically repetitions of um, the plot C and D uh, on the right side. Uh, only now the dots are not colored by the sort of dominant color of the artwork, but by do they sell red or do they not sell blue? So, and this is a heat map, obviously. So you can see if in a particular time, in that particular um, PC dimension, something tends to sell or not. And you can see that these things that were introduced, these sort of like board ape-like uh, things, they don't sell, which is really interesting. So somebody sort of like uh, decided to move to an aesthetic space that is not yet beset, is super simple in terms of like really compressible, but then sort of in higher order dimensions, like even a PC2, it's sort of like confused into the background, sort of like, you know, um, uh, one could have a longer debate and further analysis of like how uninteresting this actually is. But one of the interesting things is they don't tend to sell. And we can actually sort of like do, for, we could do further analysis on this. There is one exception though, which I would like to point you to, which is around at, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but I move up and down here at the plot C upper right corner. You can see here at around day 120, there's after the gap here, there is an onset where again, there is a, a huge burst of non-selling of these sort of avatar pictures, which then, however, in the wake, um, has a lot of things that actually do sell sort of like, um, you know, as, um, I don't know, uh, accidentally or whatever. So there's a really interesting thing that we can now discuss sort of like the quality of artworks aesthetically in uh, multiple different ways against these sort of art market dynamics and um, dynamics over time. Obviously, and this is just the first glimpse. Um, <clears throat> here, just to completion, um, you can see uh, at the top three rows are the artworks that were um, the top 25 artworks um, at the beginning of the NFT market. And at the bottom, you can see uh, the ones at the end of this of our study period. And you can see there's very clear difference in terms of like, uh, you know, how complex these artworks are. Another thing we can do with our thing is uh, we can actually say, okay, now we have embedded these artworks in a multidimensional space. And we want to know um, how does this space evolve over time? And uh, as a first uh, sort of like sizzle for that, because obviously there is plenty of work to do, let's just look at uh, individual artists and how they move through that space. And uh, we came up with a concept called temporal resemblance, which works the following way. It's not the general zeitgeist, but it's basically the top uh, nearest uh, neighbors, top 100 nearest neighbors uh, to an artist which, uh, on, of a painting, which are not by the same artist. Okay, so, so the idea is look at an artwork uh, and you look at the nearest neighbors, um, the hundreds and your hundred nearest neighbors, except for the artworks that are by the artists themselves. And just by doing that, we uh, obviously we can draw a plot which um, sort of moves left to right over the career of the artist. And then top to bottom, we can say um, relative to these hundred neighbors, they all have a date. So there is a median date. Um, is the artwork of the artist from which we measure ahead of its time, in time, or sort of like lagging behind. And just by doing that, we get a really clear notion of different career types. It's almost like the narrative types of Kurt Vonnegut. Um, and so you can see uh, Piet Mondrian, and I have a better picture later, um, starts out sort of mainstream and then sort of like very clearly sort of <coughs> rises above the median. Um, uh, yes. Uh, the um, Paul Sun, the second category is people who are slightly ahead of time all the time, but are also very versatile. So Cezanne can actually draw uh, and do paintings that look like Titian or Rubens. So really old school paintings. He does this, you know, if he does a portrait for a friend and stuff like that. Uh, while people like Albert Bierstadt, who's famous for his American landscapes, 
you know, basically all the posters of national parks, uh, sort of even if they're photographs, are basically versions of a Bierstadt painting, one could say. Um, so he's very much in line with his uh, 100 nearest neighbors. So he's very zeitgeist in sort of what people expect, but sort of like obviously specific in what he depicts. So that's the reason he's famous. And then there's these people like Whistler uh, or Mary Chase, who sort of rise to their moment in time and then either sort of like become boring again or the world catches up with them. That's obviously also a possibility. Um, <laughs> so, right, um, no matter how original you are, if people are sort of like just following and doing your stuff, then basically you will still be sort of like look old. Um, okay, so here's the same thing, sort of like looking in large. Um, Mondrian, you can see the beginning very realistic. If you have ever been to the place where he painted in Domburg in the Netherlands, uh, different parts of the day staring into the land or out at sea, you can actually see these kind of colors. Um, but then he realized, okay, red bricks, a blue sky, uh, becoming more stereometric and over time. And, you know, it's like at some point his trees become ever more regularized. And then that's when he literally takes off. And so this is like how this plot is explainable. Um, similar, you can, what I just said about Sisan, you can see that in the plot too, um, and the same for Bierstadt and, and Whistler. So this is sort of like um, um, what we can do with this. But then um, I just want to return to this little picture here. So this is really constituting a new field of study because now we have constituted that space. And uh, what we can do is we can, for example, embed all the images that went through a neural network or have been studied by an art historian. Um, and we can actually compare, um, you know, how do they behave? How do different embeddings behave and stuff like that? So this is really sort of a reference. Um, um, you know, we have a reference topography, which is our UMAP, but this plot um, in addition sort of like is a kind of topographic array against which we can compare many, many other things. And if you don't like the fact that it looks irregular and whatever, that's, um, you know, obviously uh, one could do it a different way, but the key thing is that it works. That's, that's sort of the cool thing. Um, one thing that led to this picture, which I would like to show you is that you can basically take any two dimensions um, and what I will show you will uh, uses TCNE, not UMAP, but it could be anything. It could be PC1 and PC2. Actually, I think it's PC1 and PC2 of uh, some other principal component analysis thing with a preliminary data set. Um, so imagine the value range of PC1 is the x-axis, the value range of PC2 is the y-axis, and then you just cycle through PC3, for example, right? And so to do that, I need to sort of like uh, reshare my screen um, and so here you can see this happening, right? And I, I, I encourage you to stare at particular points. So uh, let me go here. Like you see my mouse here. So you see something that sort of like is, is sort of an attractor that, uh, you know, sort of like is a sink, uh, while um, there is other uh, points in the space that sort of like, uh, you know, spread um, uh, information. And so showing this to people in the lab, um, there is, you know, plenty of things that come to mind, uh, obviously, you know, burning gas and attractors and uh, stuff like that. Um, so the, the key thing is, I think this is something that warrants further studies in all its dimensionality, um, because um, there is a lot of information in here that we uh, don't fully understand. It is not just arbitrary sort of like errors of, um, you know, projection in the UMAP, for example, but there is something else going on. And so the question is, can we actually from here go to a kind of, uh, you know, not only artificial neural science, but a kind of multidimensional fluid dynamics of meaning. Uh, when I when I proposed this the first time to the ERC, I was declared nuts, and I'm 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 very happy that we're getting closer to it. Uh, so at least we won't be declared nuts next time. I hope. Um, okay, so let me reshare my screen again, um, and then go on. So I I've used about forty minutes of my time. Um, and now I, I'm going to give you a cavalcade through other spaces. 
Um, so far, we have talked about visual family resemblance. We have constituted this uh, multidimensional space across these arbitrary transformations. And there can be no doubt this is probably different for every one of us. Um, but the key thing is like, no matter what sunglasses you wear, you should wear different sunglasses and basically squint like an owl from different sides. Uh, it's something to understand it. So um, our one sentence, um, summary of what I just showed you is like um, uh, you need uh, sort of like a variety of shitty perceptions lead to deep understanding. That's basically sort of the one sentence. Okay, so um, relational space. So there is something completely different going on, which still is not the Euclidean three-dimensional space. So multiplicity of complex networks. So this is one sort of medium simple database entry of a decorated column base, like, you know, the thing that is like at the bottom of a, of a Corinthian column, um, um, publications about it, uh, locations it is or has been, uh, events when it has been restored, uh, who has documented it and stuff like that. So this is sort of like a hypergraph motive, which uh, sort of like is put into the database typically in one go. Uh, so all the information or maybe in multiple goes, but you can imagine, um, that uh, a database in art research that sort of like collects all the information for uh, such objects actually sort of works like, uh, uh, you know, it's like a knowledge graph that is um, uh, a superimposition of such motifs. This reminds of the graph rewriting, um, I think, um, that we uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, obviously, it's not that simple because it's different every single time. And just to give you a notion of like how not simple this is, is the uh, size distribution of these hypergraph motifs that are put into such knowledge graphs typically is... Um, sort of fat tail distributed. So there's very, uh, there's a lot of things that are, you know, where you have one nugget of information, but sometimes you have like a massive thing that like comes together, makes only makes sense if it comes together. So now, but one thing that is important here, this is the state of late nineties, is that we got a network with different node types and different link types. This took a very long time for network science to catch up on, which is now called multi-layer, multiplex, and multi-whatever um, uh, network science. Um, and we still have not made fully sense of how this sort of like works um, in terms of generating mechanisms, in terms of dynamics, in terms of possibility and stuff like that. But what we know is we have a complex system of um, a, like a network of complex networks, basically. Here you see one smallish art historical database. Um, the matrix is the data model and the cells are the different link types um, that are sort of like here all depicted. So you see all the instances of such a, a database in one data model. And um, I don't wanna go into full detail. So please lead to that book chapter if you wanna know how you can extract such an image from uh, a, a knowledge graph database or any other relational database for that manner. I just want to point to the fact that this is sort of the master construct uh, over smaller uh, sort of selections of networks. So what you see in the upper left corner here, monument documentation, this is what my PhD was on. This is what the so-called census of antique works of art and architecture known in the Renaissance was on. This is what Warburg's Nemusuna Atlas was basically on, right? So he looked at images that correlate via some similar depiction type. And so this is exactly this kind of network. Um, in the lower uh, center here, you see person location. Um, and this in particular is the, was the smoking gun for uh, something where I then said, how does this look, look for 100,000 people, people moving from their birth to their death location? Um, so monument documentation, this is a picture of my PhD and then I apologize for the resolution. This is a monument documentation network for 35,000 links uh, drawn in a, uh, Java uplet, which uh, warned that you shouldn't do anything larger than 500 nodes because other than that, your computer will crash. It took three days. Um, <laughs> but the key now looks much better and takes 20 seconds, of course. Um, so the key thing is this is just one network, something you find in this one cell here. Uh, and the second thing would be, um, would be sort of the cell down here. I get to that back later. Now, one of the interesting things is this is not new. This is now new in network science that we do multiplex networks since you know, 2008-ish. Um, but it is actually quite old. Ebi Warburg actually starts his Memnusuna Atlas where all the plates are about similarity with plate one, where he says the following. 
different systems of relations in which humans are put into, cosmic, earthly, and genealogic. And so basically the pictures he depicts is star signs, so you know, conceptual links between arbitrary nodes. Um, Earthly, what he means is distance between locations, so obviously the you know, um, uh, wayfinding, route planning, um, and kinship, which is the genealogy. So he also says actually separating all of these is already something that requires thinking. So in mythical thinking, that's his hypothesis, all these things are one thing. Um, now, one of the neat things is these three plates are basically three cells in the matrix I've just shown you. And obviously we can look at all these other cells too. And uh, if you do this systematically, uh, you can do things like this. So here I um, told you monument documentation, person, birth or death location, which actually led us to Net Science uh, magazine where we looked at uh, how people move from, noted people move from birth to death location, which recovers the so-called laws of migration of Robinstein. Uh, and at the same time recovers the instability of cities over centuries, which is a fundamental instability. Um, it looks similar in different data sets, uh, but nevertheless is, 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 is massive. Um, and so um, it's a really interesting result because um, what this means is that A, quantification humanity is possible and B, uh, qualitative research is necessary because on a local level, there is so much fluctuation that you basically have to check in the archive. Okay. So this is like this paper, um, and there was a famous video that came with it. Um, here's sort of like some of the plots. Um, and so you can clearly see, and this is sort of something which is also quite interesting from the history of science. Um, uh, obviously the plot um, um, uh, conventions are either coming from complexity science, you know, these uh, sort of like cumulative tail plots, or from demographics, which is like what you can see uh, the, the blue thing, um, is the sort of like death age over time. And at the bottom, um, this is sort of um, death rate over expression or under expression, uh, which is um, something that, you know, yes, it's a timeline plot, but uh, the parodying was stolen obviously from a gene transcription plot. So this is kind of a, a multidisciplinary side note that, uh, you know, never, never, never stop reading stuff that other people do in other disciplines, maybe worthwhile. Okay. So now we have two kinds of spaces covered. So we have a, a, a multidimensional vector space and that is measured. And we have a, a topological space of networks where there is not necessarily a, sort of like an extension on a, sort of the space, but it's literally just a topological space. Now, the question is, grid space, where does this come from? How does this emerge, right? Like this thing that we have like sort of geographic latitude, longitude coordinates or X, Y, C in computer games and stuff like that. Because now this is so fundamental that people think it's the, it's, you know, it, it must be first, right? So <clears throat> that's what I, why I call it AKA space. And so where does this come from? And so I added this to this talk um, just to give you a perspective from the point of view of art history and the history of drawings. So this thing, is the figure one from uh, Euler's 1736 Königsberg Bridge problem paper, which, uh, by the way, in um, sentence one, he says he stole the idea from Leibniz. Um, um, Geometrium situs really means analysis situs. And one of the interesting things here is that, um, so this is a map of Königsberg, which is obviously very reduced and symbolic. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry for, for coughing, I uh, found out two days ago that I'm corona positive. <laughs> so the key thing is here, um, the, the map is reduced and basically reduced to symbolic letters. So A, B, C, D writ large is the locations and uh, A, B, C, D, G, uh, E, uh, F is actually the bridges. So nodes and links, so to say, right? And this is sort of like seen as the start of graph theory and network science. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, it seems like that uh, Euler made the step of adding these symbolic uh, letters, uh, that there is a great amount of originality in there. But um, I'd like to make you consider the material that he was exposed to. This is a map by Merian, which is uh, older. Uh, something like this map Euler probably saw. 
Um, and uh, I would like to point you to the legend at the bottom, which actually has reference letters, A, B, C, D, F, G, to M, uh, which actually symbolize, um, you know, uh, sites uh, or, or points of interest in the city, like the castle is A on top, the church is F on the island, and so on, right? So this is a sort of notion that was sort of ubiquitous in maps like this. Now, one of the interesting things is that this Marian map is a perspective that is quite like, just think about that. There, there were no airplanes, there were no balloons and stuff like that. Somebody has to come up with this. They have to measure, triangulate, and then basically like build a little model, at least on paper or on their head, uh, to actually be able to sort of like draw that in, in perspective. Um, let me give you an earlier example. This is a drawing by Giovanni Antonio Dosio. Um, of the city of Rome that very much sort of like represents that. And I, 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 I colored the Roman baths in here, which are either sort of fully or um, not fully, but, you know, better or not so well preserved in blue or red. Um, and so this map is fantastic. So it looks like a tiny drawing, right? But <laughs> the key thing is like, there is no spec on this map that doesn't have meaning and wasn't really there. If you, you can see that on different other Map. So this is obviously what the, what's underlying the Marian depiction. There is no reference letters on this map. Now, if you go to older examples, like much older examples, you find things like this. Uh, this is Rome built in the mode of a lie, around 1330 or something, like 14th century. And now uh, this looks like a really shabby depiction of Rome, but... There is a number of landmarks. And if you know your way, if you know the streets, like, you know, you walk down uh, Alta Semita uh, from the Bath of Diocletian, that awfully looks like the tail of a lion. And then you do this turn and then you see the city in front of you. So this thing is perfect for wayfinding. Even today, if you know how to read these things, which is not quite easy because names change and stuff, uh, you can use this map to find your way around in Rome today. And certainly on that map that those you just painted. And so the interesting thing is this is much closer to what Euler does than uh, what, um, um, what Dozio does, right? Um, so you have these sort of reference points and, you know, there is no real uh, cool angular relationship and stuff like that going on. But sort of relationship-wise, this per makes perfect sense. Now, uh, let, me, let, me, let me drive home that point a little further. How are these Marian-like depictions, like the good perspectives, how are they done? Typically, you go into the field and you document parts and fragments, samples of the ruins uh, and, and, and parts of the city. And then you work your way up to have sort of like a, a sort of more complete reconstruction, which you see in the center here. Then ironically, these complete reconstructions are sampled again and remixed, which is a whole other talk, whole other story. And actually this whole sort of like nexus of grid space here, I could talk for uh, easily an entire semester, but I don't. I just wanna give you one example. So um, what you see in the first row, second picture from the left, this is a convolute of about 200 drawings uh, of the boss of Caracalla, which assumes symmetry, by the way. Um, which uh, sort of try to reconstruct or allow for a full reconstruction of the boss of Caracalla. And I'm going to show you one drawing from that. So this is 1455. Um, okay. Um, okay, this is the one. This is 1455. You see the full drawing on the right and you see a cutout uh, on the left. And so you can see that actually, this is not one drawing. Um, here, this triangular staircase reappears here on the right with a reference letter called B, which actually roots it in the, uh, in the, in the original drawing. You can see these geometrically congruent uh, things like, you know, these kind of um, rectangular pillars with a column in front with additional measures. So the key thing is what you have here is a drawing that is actually a, not geometrically congruent, but sort of like blown out of proportion in different ways. And whenever the space is not sufficient enough, you do a call out. You, if, if you think it's too hard, you do a reference letter and then basically sort of like uh, make your way in. And it's really hard one to arrive at a situation like this 
where you actually have full geometric congruence with the ruin. So this is uh, so-called Master C of 1519 in the Albertina in Vienna, who um, was a very incredible architect, but we don't know who it was. And here you don't need these measurements. You don't need the callouts because you can actually measure on the drawing. So in other, way, in other words, it's really hard one to arrive at grid space where you can actually do that. And typically this happens via these kind of relational uh, sort of references. And I like you to consider that whenever you look at a 3D reconstruction that uses ground plan, elevation, section, and perspective, including in modern computer games in Unity or Maya or whatever Pixar does, there is typically a graph in the background of relational uh, program functions that call themselves uh, and actually pull together the assets to actually sort of embed stuff in this space. So it's not that grid space is the base of everything, but cognitively, the relation are sort of like what basically binds it all together. And then we project it into this sort of like ideal space. Okay. Um, so I have two more points. Um, Conventional space. Um, so also throughout the conference, we had this uh, thing that, um, you know, the question is how real is the space that you depict? <coughs> and so there the question is, okay, is there such a thing as a kind of relationship between what you think and what you depict, or is there something else going on? And so this point here, this, this title here is a little snarky. Uh, I call it AKA Horizon 2020 because we published it in 2020 in PNAS and the paper is about horizons. So it's dissecting landscape art history with information theory. And so here we did something very, very simple. Uh, we took 15K landscape paintings and for whatever reason, my slide forwarding seems to jump. Um, okay, now this works. So what we did is we basically dissected artworks to minimize or maximize the entropy difference between the two sides of the dissection. So ideally, if you do this until the end, uh, you should end up with rectangles that basically have the same color of pixel. And now, uh, very long story, very short, uh, this really works well for landscape painting and it particularly works well for the first dissection, basically the horizon. And so you can see this in figure E, uh, so the uh, horizontal and vertical, the first uh, dissection are really sort of meaningful and differentiate the whole thing. I don't wanna go into detail here. Um, this actually, I, interestingly, evolves over time. So the dominant horizon in the majority of paintings evolves contiguously over time. If there is national differences, it's because the nations are, have a sampling bias. So Dutch landscape painting we typically have from the 17th century, a lot of landscape paintings are from different centuries. So that may be a national difference. There is no national difference. It's actually, we learned that from a reviewer. Thank you to that person. Uh, but you can see here in the upper uh, left um, in the second plot from the left, you can actually see these two pink lines, uh, magenta lines. You can see that this, uh, there, there is some systematic thing going on. And actually, uh, this is much more nice in this particular plot. Uh, here you see three versions. So over years, so 20 year brackets, um, moving time window, conventional style periods. So the style periods we got from the data set and just artist individuals. And note that the uh, dissection ratio, which is on the x-axis, is very broadly distributed. So all sorts of stuff is possible at all times, but you can clearly see that the peak uh, of the, 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 the first, you know, the, uh, the, the peak of the one modal distribution, and it's always a one modal distribution, is also interesting, uh, actually moves from sort of like 0.5 to 0.3 over time. So you can um, probably most clearly see this um, in the individuals, even though it's more noisy, but you can see systematically left. Um, I also would like you to, this is probably something for the, uh, Carlos sort of mentioned after number, you know, there's number, space, time, and whatever. So I, I, I sort of anticipate the next conference will be temporal temporality. Um, in this plot, you can see three different timelines of art history, uh, which are nonlinear in different ways. So to the left, you see sort of like linear 20-year um, brackets, but then to the right with the, uh, the number of artists grows exponentially and the number of um, 
as such, the buckets of style periods sort of like bifurcates quicker over time. So you can actually see the same phenomenon in different timelines, actually. Okay, so now we got a number of different things together. We got similarity space, we had multidimensional vector spaces um, of the different transformations. We had a uh, relational space of networks with different node and link types. And we talked about grid space. And I talked a little bit about this conventionality. And I actually should uh, mention this to you here. So there is absolutely zero expectation why this should be the case. There's zero expectation why the dominant horizon should move systematically over time. So there's two reasons why this could be. One is there is a systematic storytelling error on, on behalf of the people who do landscape art history um, or the selection, uh, or uh, it's actually true. Probably it's a mixture of both, right? Because there's this kind of thing that, um, you know, more interesting stuff happens on the ground and like as we have more photography, people sort of like, you know, there's more, more sky. Um, so this may be the case. We don't know. But the key thing is in this paper, and this is too difficult to, 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 to like fold out here, but I encourage you to read it. It's really important to look at these art data sets, not as art history, but what they actually are, are sort of the um, waste product um, of sort of large reprographed uh, sets of images typically for you know, lecture series and stuff like that, from a literature which itself selected from the historical material, which may be reflecting history. So there's like several filters going on. It's really difficult to take, uh, take a, a hold of real art history. And so one way to do so is to actually look at full catalog resumes of artists, which is sort of what we do in the compression paper. Um, that I introduced at the beginning. But so there's this kind of thing that it's really hard when you do quantitative art history. It's like, when are you talking about the discipline of art history? When do you talk about art history, the historical system? So, but the key thing is landscape art history is very, very clearly, landscape painting is very clearly conventional because it seems to be so bound. This is sort of also qualitatively known. Landscapes are brown in the foreground, blue in the background until about 1830. When Constable then finally sort of like does some green in the foreground. Um, similar things happen like and basically the inverse, which I think is quite interesting, is there is no such thing as different style periods we now call isms. In this paper, we find that the construction of the horizon in the landscape is basically the same across all isms. So we're not living in the period of um, isms as style periods, but we're living in the style period of isms. It's one style period which is quite fun. So variation of a many, many different parameters, but sort of like some parameters stay fixed, which is in this particular case, the horizon. Okay, so now that we have all these different space concepts, similarity, which is one kind of relation, but a special one, relations in general, um, um, grid space in general, and the question if this is conventional. Now let's talk about space in general. And so this, please give me another uh, sort of like eight to 10 minutes. Um, this particular slide is actually uh, a reference to an apocryphic joke, or the joke that's an apocryphic story about Abby Warburg. So Abby Warburg, as I said, lost his distance by looking at too many uh, similar images, and basically he ran into the problem that his matrix of similarities um, is obviously, um, you know, you can permutate it forever. <laughs> and, and sort of like he, he was known to sit in a corner and sort of resorting his photo papers. And at some point he went nuts over it. And uh, so when he was sort of like in the sanatorium, which were famous, um, uh, supposedly a nurse came up to him and said like, Mr. Warburg, uh, your family is in the space, room and space, same word in German. And he supposedly has said, do you mean space per se in general, or this space in particular. And so what I do in the next eight minutes, hopefully gives you a glimpse in like what is meant by this, because this seems like a joke, but it's not. Okay, so here is Leibniz's core definition of space. And I think that is sort of something that is really, really important. So this is after a very, very long time, Leibniz ends up with this document in 1714, which is called Initiarum Mathematicorum Metaphysica. So basically the, 
um, the, the outline of uh, mathematical metaphysics things, um, which he also called de calculus situm, so about the calculus of situs, so analysis situs. And so I, I, I like to point you to, to this one definition. Spatium, space, is the order of coexistence or the order of existence between those who are seen. Cetus is the mode of coexistence, therefore not involving quantity, but quality. So here's the point. The space is constituted by at least obviously two CT or maybe one um, that are simul, meaning they're at the same time, compresent as he says somewhere else. And he very explicitly says, there's no quantity going on here. It's just qualitative. So this gives you the relational space already. So this is from, from there, it follows you can do relational space. But then he says, okay, extensio is the spatial magnitude, the ratio is the temporal magnitude. And obviously that's when he means, okay, we can make this quantitative by having extension uh, across space and duration. And uh, so I could talk long about this, a very long story, very short. Uh, this is if you follow um, the sort of like bifurcations <laughs> um, or trace back the sort of like ancestor's tale, uh, you will find out that this is what Euler goes back to with his uh, Königsberg bridging, which from which follows graphs in your network science. This is also where Poincaré's analysis situs comes from, who ironically had to edit the manuscripts of Leibniz. He read all of them and then had his own analysis situs and never published the Leibniz pieces. Um, but he adds himself as like sort of Leibnizian by sort of listing the terms in 1910. So obviously topology flows from that. The interesting thing is that uh, Couturat's algebra of logic also goes back to this, which we know from Chaudin, who's, who actually ties it in a foreword to Leibniz. And that is the basis for Shannon's master thesis of circuit diagrams. Um, and then for me, obviously one of the most important connections is Ernst Cassirer, brings all of this together with his substance and function, philosophy of science and as a philosophy of symbolic forms, which is the root of the kind of art history we're sort of circling around of, um, you know, every, um, every Warburg and so on. So all these things can now be brought together because as you have seen, I use network science, I, uh, you know, use computation, whatever. But the key thing is this does not need to be separate. It's not like as an art historian, you call in the cavalry to do your computation and stuff like that. It really has to be thought as one process. That's sort of like one of the key take homes here. And um, how does this fold out? Let me give you some glimpse into Kassir's uh, sort of view of the world. In 1925, in a fulminant three pages, um, he writes down in his three volume massive um, philosophy of symbolic forms, a three page summary of his spatial concepts, which come from Leibniz over uh, substance and function, a bunch of other things, uh, which he calls a foundational outline of a doctrine regarding the symbolic form of myth. And uh, so in this sort of doctrine, there is four different types of spaces. One is mythical space. This is the same idea of our book has that sort of like, before you all separate these concepts, there must be one thing. So this is what they're actually after. This is basically the question they, they were really poignant. They said like, how does the worldview post Chardana Bruno, uh, right? The mathematical worldview arise from this, like whatever was there before. And so obviously this is the one thing where they may be the most off because now we make progress. Uh, but then there is these other three concepts of space, which are really, really cool. Three is metric space, which Euclidean geometry underlies its construction. This is what we just talked about when we talked about architectural drawings. And then four, the space of pure knowledge, space of geometric intuition, thought, space of pure mathematics, thinking space of geometry, pure space of geometry, geometric conceptual space, abstract space of pure knowledge. He does a Loretan litany, like the names of St. Mary on this space, because he actually is very aware that he cannot put it into words. But it's very clear when he means pure mathematics, if you read substance function, what he means is, is indeed Hilbert, right? So he means pure mathematics. So that means there is... Um, it can be multidimensional and so on. There's like all sorts of stuff that follows from that. And basically, I think what this captures is both the relational space and these multidimensional vector spaces. And then one thing that glues it all together is this second concept, which is to central space of perception, seeing and tactical space, facial space and tactical space, which is very clear, he says, is anisotropic. So basically the idea is if you assume the real world is really three-dimensional Euclidean, 
And inside your brain, you have some kind of pure geometric mathematic knowledge space going on, either relational or whatever, then there needs to be some kind of transformation. What Warburg and Edgar Wim called, um, they called this Hingabe and Behauptung. So there's stuff coming out of the brain, stuff going into the brain, and there's some kind of transformation function, a little bit like the transformation, like Lorentz transformation between reference frame and general relativity. And this is, this is not too far out because Kassira actually wrote the uh, sort of an explanation, a whole book on uh, general relativity, which is actually proofread by Einstein. So th th these kind of things are, uh, are not too far out uh, uh, to, to, to actually have substance. It's, it's a really interesting thing that they basically laid out in front uh, in order to sort of like make it actionable, but then art history never followed up on it because obviously art history is done by humanists and there's this kind of like way of working that we work now is just not there. Okay, so one uh, slide here just to uh, give you an idea that this is really like Nitzian. Max this is the same. Yes, Max, uh, uh, Tal is asking what, what is the name of the book that Einstein uh, have read? Um, yeah, um, give, me, give me a second. Um, um, yeah, I, did, I, I, I will look it up in a second, okay? So, sorry, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm too much in the talk. Okay, so uh, here's just one, one notion that, um, like, this is really Leibnizian. So, Kassir means with the litany becomes crystal clear when he says, elements or points that connect to constitute geometric space are nothing else but positional situations, Lagebestimmungen, have no content outside these relations, purely functional, no substantial being. And he talks about generating mechanisms and stuff like that. It's really fascinating. So this is actually also word by word, almost the same as sort of like uh, Poincaré's um, explanation of analysis CITES in 1910. Um, okay, so obviously there is a bracket we can put around um, all these different things. So this concept, and obviously I only gave you a glimpse here, of space, symbol, symbolic relations, symbolic form, as defined by Kassira, as inspired by Leibniz, is obviously uh, very much related to these other concepts like Leibniz methodology, quantum mechanics and physics, vector spaces and machine learning, feature spaces, which means you know you just measure brightness, or like in our case, uh, we measure these different transformation dimensions, not sort of like some um, um, some some neural network weights or whatever. So they're also vector spaces. Uh, but they could also be categorical. I could say, you know, male, female is, is, is a category dimension. Um, the curse of dimensionality, like how do you actually project and stuff like that in data visualization, bipartite classification in libraries, and so-called kinds of relations slash multilayer networks. And this is really fascinating. Leibniz actually spells this out. He says like, um, similarity, order, and relations universally. So he basically sort of like gives you the exact the structure of this talk. There is similarity, then there is sort of like more general networks, and then there's like all sorts of dimensions uh, in general. Okay, so basically that's it. Um, um, I hope I gave you some sort of like different aspects again. Um, and so I hope uh, they all sort of like fit together somewhat. Um, but I follow the same strategy as with our uh, sunglasses in front of a neural network or the compression um, 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 approach, where basically we look at uh, the system in different ways, and that will lead to deeper understanding. And um, I like to um, give kudos to um, all my collaborators. Uh, and so this means in particular for the landscape paper, this is a Korean team uh, where I'm byung -Wi Lee, who is the first author, Hao Wong Yong from KAIST. Um, obviously people at Barabasi Lab at ETH Zurich, which, uh, whom I have done this like um, birth death paper. Um, Many people I have been involved in uh, all my life. Uh, lots of this work goes back 20 years. And then the last thing is actually Anders Karius, Tilman Ohm, and Mark Conant from our own team, and Sebastian Arnold from um, the University of Cambridge and the Turing Institute. And uh, so obviously this is only one aspect of the kind of stuff we have going on. Um, here you see the six senior and uh, junior fellow and the six junior fellows of the Cultural Data Analytics uh, era chair research group, which is a thing that is a 2.5 million euro project funded at Tallinn University by the European Commission. And one of our goals is to A, sustain what we're doing. And um, we aim to do so by uh, sort of exploring at the one hand, 
these kind of systematic spaces, but all of the fellows actually have more specific topics, which basically allow them to sort of like sustain themselves without um, being endangered by the, um, by the problem that true multidisciplinarity as it is supported by SEMF is not something that is really easy to support um, if you're sort of dependent on regular funding institutions. So you need some kind of home um, and then you could do crazy stuff in essence. So, um, and I made the mistake to do crazy stuff exclusively. Um, thank you very much.